in a small country town. I wanted to learn everything country so that I could fit in. As I was searching for Widow Jones's farm, I got lost on the back roads. I saw a farmer walking into his barn, so I stopped to ask for directions. He was just beginning to milk his cow, but he took time out to tell me how to get to the Jones farm. By the way, I ask, do you know what time it is? He leaned into the udder of the cow and he said, 1230. I started to leave, but I just had to know. I said to him, hey, I've just moved here from the city and I really want to know the ways of the country. How could you tell what time it was from the udder of the cow? The farmer said, sit right down here on this stool, son, on the milking stool. Now grab a hold of that udder. I did. Before this, my closest experience to this was grabbing a milk carton. Now lean into that cow and lift up the udder. And I did. He said, lean over and look right over there on that wall. See, that's a clock. When the little hand is on the 12, <laughs> he's had to move the udder out of the way so he could look over to the clock. And that was the end of that mystery. <laughs> Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 7. When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we ask for you to pour, pour your anointing and your blessing upon these morsels from your word as we look into these truths, Lord. And we pray that you will direct them to where you would have them go and they would have the effect that you would have them to have in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the book of Exodus, chapter 25, verse 10 to 16, uh, Moses was instructed to build an ark, to build a container, a box. The Ark of the Covenant, as it was called, was the most special container that ever was built on the earth. There were specific instructions as to the dimensions and materials that were used. The ark was to be made of acacia wood, covered with gold inside and out. The box or ark would be the container for the stone tablets that God himself inscribed with the law. Above the ark would be the place where God's presence would be manifested, and that was known as the mercy seat, sometimes called the atonement cover. In Exodus chapter 25, starting with verse 17, the instructions for the lid of the ark. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. Do you know what a cubit is? It's, it's this right here. Depends on whose arm it is, how long it is, but it's approximately 18 inches. Although some Jewish scholars say that the official cubit was 22 inches nobody really knows but it was probably a yard and nine two yards and a yard and nine inches well anyway uh, I'm getting off track here <laughs> and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover make one cherub one end at of one end and the second cherub on the other end make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends the cherubim are to have their wings spread upward overshadowing the cover with them the cherubim are to face each other looking toward the cover 
face to face, but looking down at the cover itself. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law that I will give you. There above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the covenant, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. He was given the instructions to build this ark before he was given the Ten Commandments. Because he said, I will, I will give you. The atonement cover, or I've, in 16 translations that I found, um, I didn't look through 16 Bibles, to, I, look, I looked online. 16 translations, the Hebrew word kafar is translated as mercy seat. And also in some translations as the atonement cover. The atonement cover or mercy seat is the covering of the ark. It's apparently a lid, a cover. It was all gold. The rest of the ark was made out of wood covered with gold inside and out. Thin gold that they hammered out. But the, but the lid was apparently solid gold. Uh, not wood with a gold covering. It doesn't say how thick it was. But it would have to be sort of thick, not to sag in the middle, I would think. I don't know how stiff gold is. I never had any. <laughs> but maybe it was a quarter of an inch, maybe three-eighths. I don't really know. But can you imagine how heavy it was? Gold is really heavy. And then that ark, even the poles were covered with gold. Can you imagine how? And there were only four people carrying it. There were two poles and two handles and two people could, could do the handles I guess but four people that's that's a lot of gold and a very heavy but this Hebrew word kafar means to cover over but it's often translated as atonement the word atonement is an abstract word and in order to understand the true Hebrew meaning of a word you must look into the concrete meaning. So, if an offense has been made, the one that has been offended can act as though the offense is covered over and unseen. There's a covering. If the offended person doesn't want to act offended, there's a covering. That's what that means. So we express this idea through the word forgiveness. Atonement is an outward action that covers over the error or the offense. In other words, the sin. The mercy seat is a place from which mercy is extended to the offender, to the sinner, in other words. It isn't a seat in the sense of a chair or a stool to be sat on. It's more of a place from which authority is dispensed, like the county seat. It's that kind of a seat. The county seat. In other, in other words, it's the seat of God's mercy and grace because he said, I will meet you above the atonement cover or the mercy seat uh, between the cherubim. The atonement cover or mercy seat is a place from which God administered forgiveness. God would meet Moses there and give him commands, instructions. The mercy seat was also the place where atonement uh, would be made in an annual sacrifice. The mercy seat was hidden by a curtain from the people. It was in the Holy of Holies, the most inner sanctum. There was a holy place and then there was the Holy of Holies and there was a curtain there and inside of that area was where the Ark of the Covenant <clears throat> was kept. Only the high priest could go, I'm sure you all know about this, could go behind that curtain. He could only go there once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. The high priest would enter the Holy of Holies. He would go behind the curtain. 
He had to be very careful he didn't touch that ark or he would die. That's how sacred that place was. But he would make atonement for himself and for the people by sprinkling the blood of a sacrificial goat. But the blood was sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat. With his finger, he would sprinkle that blood on there once a year. The atonement then was only temporary. The atonement had to be replaced annually. It, couldn't, it wasn't permanent. It had to be redone every year. It was only a shadow of the ultimate atonement that Jesus would do on the cross. Under the old covenant, God accepted the blood of a sinless animal as an atonement for sin. But that was only a shadow of the blood of the Lord Jesus, which would be shed for us on the cross of Calvary. Amen. <clears throat> the mercy seat was not something to be taken lightly. It was serious business with God. In 1 Samuel 6, 19, But God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death, because they looked into the ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. They couldn't even touch it. They had to carry it by the poles. They were instructed how to do this and nothing else would, would suffice. Jesus came to pay the price. Uh, he came to make the ultimate sacrifice for us on the cross of Calvary. All of the animal sacrifices that were made before <clears throat> Jesus before crucifixion <clears throat> were a temporary foreshadowing of the ultimate sacrifice that would come. On the cross, Jesus sprinkled his own blood before the Father. His blood, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> his blood satisfied the requirement for every sin that had been committed. His blood satisfied the requirement for every sin that would be committed. His blood satisfied the requirement from my sins. And His blood satisfied the requirement for your sins. In John 19.30, it said, Jesus, uh, when He had received the drink, He said, It is finished. With that, He bowed His head and gave up His spirit. Finished. Nothing else had to be done. God would be satisfied. Never again would people have to go through a priest carrying animal blood. When Jesus gave up his life in Matthew 27, 50 to 52, it says, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. The curtain which shielded the ark from the view of the common people and even the other priests and Levites, except for the one, except for the high priest, and that only one time a year. And he didn't dare even go behind that curtain unless he had the blood. The function of the priesthood was never needed again because the curtain was rent from top to bottom. There was no more shielding of the holy of holies of the mercy seat from common people. Oh, they kept doing it. They kept doing it. They kept sacrificing animals until the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. They kept doing it. The Catholic Church is still sacrificing Jesus every day, over and over again. That's what they think. They have a thing called transubstantiation. 
in which they think that bread actually becomes the flesh of Christ and that wine actually become, becomes his blood and they call it the daily sacrifice of the mass. They think that they need to sacrifice Jesus every day. It's kind of sad, but that's what we grew up in. You, you kind of believe what you grow up in until you start looking into it. <laughs> Amen. So now we can go in to the Holy of Holies. We can go into the very presence of God. We can go to the mercy seat. The mercy seat isn't a physical object anymore. I can go to the mercy seat at church. I can go to the mercy seat while I'm fishing. I can go to the mercy seat when I'm in my bed, when I'm on a recliner. I can go personally. I don't have to go through a priest anymore. Now I can approach God with my sin and get, forget for, and get forgiveness. When I'm afraid, I can go to the mercy seat. When I'm hurting, I can go to the mercy seat. When I'm sad, I can go to the mercy seat. I can get healed at the mercy seat. I can get peace at the mercy seat. I can get challenged at the mercy seat. I can get corrected at the mercy seat. I need correcting and challenging. We all do, some don't admit it. Romans 3.25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. This next little snippet here comes from a person named Skip Heitzig from Crosswalk. And he says, once a year the high priest entered the Holy of Holies and approached the mercy seat, the place where God was said to dwell, and sprinkled blood on it. In short, it was a testimony of their sin. It was a judgment seat, really, with the two angels looking down on the emblems of their failure. Not the angels' failure, but the failure of the people. Me. The emblems, in other words, uh, words of the failure of mankind, not to sin. What he's talking about here is what was in the ark. You know, the, the law, the Ten Commandments, was because people failed to be righteous. That was a sign of failure. They had to be dictated. The failure of mankind to please God. Heitzig goes on to explain how the New Testament describes Jesus as our propitiation for all sins. And that, and that word can be translated propitiation, which means substitute. He teaches that in the Greek, the word hilasmos, which is translated atoning sacrifice, is related to the word halasterion, which is translated mercy seat. In, uh, in John 4.10, God is telling us that Jesus is our literal mercy seat. He is the seat of forgiveness, of healing, of blessing. He is the mercy seat. And he covers all of our sins by his blood. The mercy seat was a covering. It covered the emblems of our sin. The law, the manna, Aaron's staff, represented the failures of mankind. Make it personal. Those things represent my failures. I'm desperate for the atoning 
sacrifice. I'm desperate for the mercy seat. No man comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. Amen. Thanks be to God that there is a mercy seat in heaven and that Jesus has already sprinkled his blood on it. Thanks be to God that the atonement has been made. He's the cover. He's our covering. His blood has covered my sin. Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. That's the conclusion. That's what we now should do. We should draw near to God. No priest except our high priest, Jesus himself. Draw near. No blood sacrifice is needed. Jesus already did that with his own blood. Draw near. Anytime, anywhere, he is there ready to forgive. He's ready to heal. He's ready to bless. He is the mercy seat. Draw near. Amen. To the mercy seat of God. It's not hard to do. You can just close your eyes and be there. Don't do that while you're driving. Pull over first. <laughs> the mercy seat. It's not just that gold lid that was on that ark. It's Jesus now. It's Jesus. Amen. Would you stand? I do need to see the members of the official board for a few minutes for a overdue board meeting right after church. Don't forget to come at 5 o'clock for some grub. And then at 7 o'clock in here for a concert. Don't forget about that. I'm going to let you go a little bit early. I thought that sermon would be longer than it was. <laughs> turn the clock back this Saturday. This coming Saturday. Turn the clock back. Fall back, yeah. This coming Saturday. Take the country back on Tuesday. Amen. Take the country back on Tuesday. Yeah, don't forget to do that. Well, dear Lord, we thank you that you are the mercy seat and we can access the mercy seat without a priest, without blood, without going through a curtain. You were the curtain. And dear Lord, uh, it's so awesome that we can just come to you, bring our, bring our faults and bring our needs, and that the mercy there will be applied, Lord, to us. We are desperate for your mercy, Lord. We are in desperation for that, Lord. And we thank you for your everlasting loving kindness to us, Lord. Uh, bless each one as they go their separate ways, Lord. Bring us all back safely at 5 o'clock. In Jesus' name, amen. Nice, excellent.